super important reason. Morham is a serial entrepreneur. He had several successful uh, startup companies. Uh, and what he has been doing uh, systematically during his career, he was importing um, uh, theory from the database uh, theory community and um, distilling it and applying it in practice. Uh, one of his most famous companies is Logic Blocks, which created this uh, super optimized uh, data log engine, uh, which is still highly referenced and ex ex explored today. So Morkam is going to talk about um, um, his experience talking to theoreticians. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so uh, I, earlier today, I spoke about relational AI and the company and tried to tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, Today, I want to share with you more of the insight of like why we do what we do or what we're trying to do. Um, and I love this clickbait uh, talk title. I think it's very uh, tailored to the audience here today. I, I, uh, I didn't come up with it, but I really liked it. So I'm, I'm using it with, uh, with permission. I was asking basically, hey, what do you guys want me to talk about? Um, OK, so uh, I also would love for this to be a bit of a, of a pep talk and, you know, about inventing the future and so on, like lots, lots of different futures. Uh, we can invent. Uh, so one way of sort of framing uh, a little bit of the, the future or the, that I would, I'm motivated to try to help uh, invent is goes back to a Jim Gray's Turing Award lecture in 1998. So he tried to do a very like David Hilbert style, here are the grand challenges of, of computing uh, type Turing Award lecture. And his 12th and final goal or challenge, uh, this is his slide, uh, was uh, for automatic programming, okay? So do what I mean, uh, not you know hundreds of dollars of, or hundreds of lines of code, no programming bugs. So basically he described the holy grail of programming languages and systems, devise a specification language or UI that is easy for people to express designs, like a thousand times easier, uh, that computers can compile, that can describe all applications so it's complete, and then the system should reason, in quotes, uh, again, his quotes, about the application and just make it happen. Okay, so not uniquely a Jim Gray uh, dream here. The whole communities on program synthesis, for example, and other communities uh, that work on aspects of this problem. Uh, I think the language model, uh, large language models, you know, were, were interesting to some folks because you can just say, you know, build me a XYZ application and it sort of builds it for you. But I think what, what Jim is talking about here is like having a specification language of some kind of precise uh, formal specification language that could generate uh, programs uh, that were uh, you know optimal and useful and, and, and so on. Okay. So uh, so who should do this work? Uh, you know, is it uh, systems people? Is it theory people? Uh, is it both? Okay. So uh, how do we get there? Uh, I think we all know that it, uh, it should be both, but not everybody believes that. Um, so I, uh, 13 years ago, I was at Oxford. Uh, we had kicked off a workshop called the Datalog 2.0 workshop. A lot of database theory uh, people attended. Not many uh, database assistance people showed up. And I, I endeared myself to the, to the crowd by quoting uh, Moshe Vardy in an article at Sigmund Record, and he said, you know, I'm perfectly okay if someone says, very nice work, but if you can change it a little bit here, maybe it will fit better my needs. Rather than, uh, you're wasting our time, you're wasting your time, stop bothering us, which I have to say very often uh, what we were hearing. This is in the context of like the theory people uh, in the community who are being told uh, sometimes not so nicely uh, that their work is not, uh, it's not useful, okay? And in fact, uh, I don't know if, uh, if Joe uh, sort of on his own or because he saw the, the, the slides from the Datalog 2.0 presentation, uh, but later that year at PODS, in PODS uh, 2010, uh, he kind of like owned up to that a little bit and sort of tried to reconcile, I think, between the two communities, which is something I very much appreciate. Uh, so this is again his slide, and he quoted himself and Michael Stonebreaker, uh, another Turing Award winner, which will be a theme here, uh, from a, uh, a book, they, they um, it was a collection of basically important papers in the database uh, uh, realm uh, called Readings in Database Systems. The third edition uh, used to say something to the effect of no practical applications of recursive query, 
recursive query theory have been found to date. I find it sad that the theory community is so disconnected from reality, they don't even know how their ideas are relevant. Okay. So I think this is what Moshe was talking about. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, or, uh, uh, and so I think, you know, Joe um, uh, was very uh, gracious in that he, then he pointed out how uh, there are actually, in his experience, in his lab, in his research, uh, over the last seven years, they did a lot of really cool work with uh, recursive uh, query processing. Okay. So an attempt at sort of bridging uh, uh, the two communities and making sure that, you know, we all get along and uh, we're all working, rowing in the same direction. All right. So, uh, you know, some level the talk is about theory of people making a company viable or a company successful. I would argue there are whole industries, like there's a $100 billion plus industry called the database industry that was founded by theory people, okay? So today, uh, you know, all operational databases are relational, we take that for granted, uh, but that wasn't always the case. There were, uh, before relational databases existed uh, for transactional workloads or LTP workloads or operational workloads, the real engineers used something called navigational databases, and you had uh, data with pointers you know, from one record to the next, and if you are a real engineer, you wrote COBOL and you navigated through these pointers and you programmed your way through uh, uh, through the job. Okay, uh, and so you know that was the that was the dominant model. That was the the the, the model that all uh, serious engineers uh, worked with. And when the relational model come, came out, it wasn't really taken very seriously. In fact. In 1974 at SIGFIDET, uh, these two gentlemen uh, got together to have the great debate uh, about uh, the navigational databases versus relational databases. Navigational, again, is more procedural, more programming-oriented database systems. And at the time this happened, Charles Bachman was already a Turing Award winner, and Ted Codd was just a theory researcher buried in the bowels of IBM, uh, you know, very early on in his career, you know, going up against the Turing Award winner arguing for the relational model, okay? And the basic argument uh, against the relational model is performance. Uh, it's impossible to imp implement this stuff in a, in a scalable, performant way. Uh, and if you want to be efficient, you have to follow pointers around, right? Uh, and there's no, like, magic compiler that's going to make, you know, query optimization work. So, you know, don't waste our time with that. And then the other argument, if you, again, read the stuff, it's all very well documented uh, against the relational model is programmers won't get it because, you know, programmers want to write COBOL and follow the okay. okay. And the essence of Ted's argument back was uh, separation of what from how, the specification from how you achieve it actually creates more room for performance because you can now go search for the plan that, uh, that gives you the best performance. And he's basically saying, you know, programmers are prima donnas and, you know, they're not who we should be caring about. We should be caring about end users and domain experts and so on. And they're the ones that don't want to learn computers, don't want to learn programming, and they just want to ask a question uh, uh, and get their answer. Okay. So, uh, so who won? Uh, commercially, at least, in industry. Uh, well, we know who won. Um, Oracle sort of was created to go after the operational or transactional uh, workload. Um, they actually, for a point, uh, for a period in time, they weren't called Oracle. They were called Relational Software Inc. And at roughly the same time, uh, the company that became Ingress was called Relational Technologies Inc. And at roughly the same time, the company that became Informix was called Relational Databases Inc. Uh, because their interests were very aligned at the time because they were trying to establish the relational movement against people who wanted to follow pointers around. Okay. Now, eventually, the movement won out, and they all rebranded because it wasn't so much an argument anymore uh, about whether you should do, uh, uh, you know, you should implement transactional systems in relational databases. Okay. So the first time, uh, at least I see this movie, Next time I saw this movie, it was in the context of analytical databases in the 90s. I was actually in this, uh, in this movie uh, because there were raging debates about how to do analytics. Is the multidimensional array or maybe the tensor the basic building block for analytics or should it be relations again, okay? And the serious engineers were like, of course it's arrays. That's how we do high performance computing. Uh, you know, this relational stuff was not 
designed to do high performance anything. It's slow. It's, you know, if you're lucky to get a 100 transactions per second, like how can you even waste my time with this idea of you're going to do analytics with, uh, with sort of some relational theoretical uh, uh, thing, okay? And uh, there were whole movements. It was the MOLAP movement. OLAP is uh, online analytical processing. So MOLAP stood for multidimensional arrays, uh, OLAP, and then ROLAP, okay? Uh, and uh, the ROLAP community wasn't looking so good for it uh, because, you know, serious people use multidimensional arrays for, for performance. So who won? Uh, well, you know, Teradata, Netiza, companies like Tableau. Uh, Tableau doesn't have a relational in its name, but Tableau, you know, it's a, it's an indirect reference. Uh, so to, it, they won so dominantly that if you, even if you Google Molap today, you don't find many references to Molap anymore uh, because it's just like the only way you do Olap is relationally. Okay. So uh, big data systems are, are relational today as well. That wasn't so clear. Uh, uh, you know, 10 years ago, big data is the new workload, the new dominant thing, relational model is dead, the way of the future is map reduce. you got to program your <laughs> analytics, da, da, da. There was one company at the time going, oh, you know, well, maybe if you change the architecture, you know, we can do this in a relational model. And people laughed at them, and uh, the former CEO of Snowflake is uh, involved in our company, and he says he really struggled to raise money as, as recently as, like, he was turned down 26 times or 27 times. Uh, three years or two and a half years before Snowflake had the largest software IPO of all time. Okay, so uh, relational always wins is uh, sort of the key insight here. Uh, why does the relational paradigm always wins? Well, I think because it separates the what from the how. You get a spec. It's independent of the how you implement the spec. And then you can automate away the hard parts, uh, you know, like things like query optimization, memory management, parallelization, transaction management, incrementalization, uh, it's simply put, where it applies, it automates away programming, okay? And this is an observation that has been made by others. Uh, this is, I found this sort of in the beginning of a book by Don Batori on, uh, on software engineering matters. And he said, the most significant advance in automatic programming is relational query optimization, ironically accomplished in the late 1970s. And again, talks about, give me a spec and I will, I will find you, uh, uh, autom automatically find you the implementation of that spec. Okay, and just I just want to very quickly close out. Uh, give me one more minute. The theme here, like when does it win? Okay, it doesn't it's never like a good choice at the beginning because we don't have what we need to make it work. Okay, so when does it win? It wins when computer scientists, uh, theory people, invent new algorithms, new data structures, and more expressive languages to support the workload that's interesting. Okay, so for transactions, it was inventing SQL. It was inventing the early query optimizers, the early join algorithms, the volcano style processing, the transaction management, all of that. When that stuff came into existence, okay, no one wanted to do that by hand anymore, right? For OLAP, uh, it was parallel join algorithms, bitmap indices, column stores, vectorization. These are all techniques that had to be invented to make it possible uh, to uh, support those workloads. And again, once you have that, then you don't need to program that stuff anymore. For big data, it was this new architecture, uh, cloud native separating storage from compute and adding support for uh, uh, immutable data structures and so on. And so as new workloads emerge around intelligent applications and new things like that, uh, I think there's a new generation of breakthroughs here that we're looking to, uh, to take advantage of. Things like worst case optimal join algorithms, making it possible to efficiently run uh, SQL queries with cyclic SQL queries, lots of self joins and, and, and things like that. I uh, couldn't really do that before. Uh, semantic query optimization. You heard Remy's talk earlier uh, about how that can happen and how you can improve the asymptotics of query processing. Uh, efficient incremental computation. You're going to hear from Mihai uh, about techniques uh, in that space. Uh, and new languages like language that we're working on called RHEL that makes that possible. And new normal forms and so on. So I'll close by pointing out this is a list from Hung who's a colleague, along with Slavik and Mahmoud and lots of people here who are in a research network. Uh, here's a list of stuff that we need help with. And so hopefully some, some of these uh, problems are interesting uh, for you. Here are the folks that we're currently working with, our friends in this community. I have a longer list, but these are people that we're actively engaged with right now. And you can see a lot of folks who come from the uh, uh, database theory community, algorithms community, uh, uh, and so on. We, 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 of course, also work with systems people. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'd love to uh, 
all push in this direction. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mohan. <laughs> Maybe we take one question. Yes, Alon. When do relational systems lose? Well, uh, they, they don't win when you don't have the algorithmic and data structure innovation. So I think we're getting to the point where really like all the major workloads actually can be implemented in a relational database. So like the, the architecture we've been dealing with the last 50 years where you have every application developed partly in a, you know, defined partly in a database and partly in some procedural programming language uh, was because the, the business logic, what the semantics were not really easy to implement a relation, okay? So now with these breakthroughs, I think most business logic can be implemented. And now we get to a point where end to end, you can define your whole application relationally and have the same kind of advantage that deep learning gave us with, uh, with machine learning, right? Deep learning, before deep learning, you used to have to do symbolic feature engineering by hand, and then you would do uh, you know, parameter learning uh, with continuous optimization. And by making it all end to end differentiable, you can optimize across the whole thing and automate away the, the by hand stuff. So I think if you can define the whole application relationally end to end, you create opportunities for optimization across the whole thing that you just wouldn't be able to if you had some procedural tour, you know, thing that is not amenable to analysis. Okay, I think this is all the time we have. So let's thank Morham.